We're kicking off the uh, morning with our third panel on the new um, industrial policy for a just and green transition. Um, we're hoping to get into the weeds and intricacies of this topic. Um, um, just to set some context before I introduce our great panel, is um, obviously this um, is a very hot topic, the return of industrial policy. Um, it's been sort of cast out of favour for decades, um, and in fact, as we know, most um, global South economies have been effectively banned from using industrial policy for a long time um, in favour of um, free markets which were um, imposed as the only game in town. Um, so we want to ask ourselves some sort of big meaty questions about the kind of revival in industrial policy that's being used now by many countries as a, a way to accelerate um, green industrial development and energy transitions. We've seen a host of industrial strategies, national plans, initiatives to boost green hydrogen, for example, or extractive minerals for exports. Um, and we also know there are a lot of power dynamics and um, um, underplay in geopolitics underneath a lot of this. So we want to unpack, really the, the big question is, is this more of the same? Is it being used to reinforce the status quo? Um, or can it possibly offer, if done right, a route to foster sort of systemic change? Um, please let me know if I pronounce anyone's name wrong and correct me. Um, Melanie Brussler? That's fine, yeah. That's fine. <laughs> um, so she's a senior a researcher at Commonwealth Think Tank, working to advance democratic ownership and democratic planning, green mixed economy. Um, she writes about industrial policy and strategy, economic planning, mm -hmm. macrofinance, <coughs> economic governance and management in a transatlantic context, really important stuff. <laughs> um, Olga McKeever has joined us online um, and is currently research fellow in political economy and the green transition at Copenhagen Business School, uh, honorary research fellow, senior research fellow at UCL IIPP and a research associate at Circle, Lund University. She was previously Mary Curie research fellow and prior to that worked in innovation and STI policy evaluation. So she is interested in what constitutes financial governance of the green transition and works on financial bureaucracies, climate related capabilities and state led investment, um, state led investment banks. And finally, uh, Dr. Amir Lebdoui um, is Associate Professor of Political Economy of Development at the University of Oxford and Director of the Oxford Technology and Management Centre of Development. Lots of words. Um, his research has focused on the economic diversification of resource dependent nations, green industrial policy, and low carbon innovation, commodity value change, biodiversity based development models. Um, Amir also regularly advises governments and international institutions on green industrial policy strategies. Um, we will also have some questions that will pop up um, um, for the discussions at the tables at some point. But yeah, I'm going to let Melanie kick off. Okay, great. Um, so I figure typically I like to start discussion of green industrial policy with like what does the transition necessitate in my slash the Commonwealth view. So I think in functional terms, decarbonization is an investment and in economic coordination problem. Just real asset by real asset all across the planet, we have to rapidly transform global um, capital and infrastructure stocks through investment and divestment. We have to do so quite often regardless of the profitability of such investment and divestment activity. And we have to do so with coherent sequencing such that, and uh, coordination such that we can like execute and build social and physical capacity to do this and then be able to like prevent socially harmful breakdowns um, in critical infrastructure systems and production and consumption networks in the process. It's like it's just a huge, huge undertaking. Um, in transatlantic contexts, I do think that we see an emergent supply side approach to economic governance. This is the language of um, uh, US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, and I think the language has been adopted by Rachel Reeves in the UK context, for example, um, where governance or economic governance is explicitly concerned with the, with the state attempting to govern fixed capital investment with an aim to deliver growth, decarbonization, and resilience. And this is being really heralded as the return of industrial strategy or kind of like a shift towards kind of modern green developmentalism in a G7 context. Um, and I think that this does reflect in some ways a kind of acknowledgement by the state and governing, pow like governing parties of the limits of market coordination to steer the transition. Um, but there, this turn to state-led planning um, remains really nascent and incomplete. And I think it's Commonwealth's view that this kind of hinges or like kind of like key criteria is that 
there's still a structural reliance on private investment and private ownership to be kind of take undertaking all investment and divestment activity, um, which is a, a huge problem in terms of delivering it, but also making sure that it's well coordinated. Um, so we would say that there's a risk that this new paradigm, securonomics, uh, modern progressive supply side liberalism, um, leaves undisturbed a really strict a strict division of labor between the state, like between the state and private capital, where the state just abstains entirely from undertaking direct and public investment and socializing ownership, instead relying on trying to attempt to induce private capital investment. And by capital investment, I mean like actual fixed capital, not necessarily talking about financing in this, in this uh, diagram. Um, and I think also, as we discussed yesterday, there's a huge risk that this supply side liberalism, uh, secure economics really leaves undisturbed a cognitive structure in the context of international economic hierarchy where global north states just refuse outright to redistribute global wealth and power, which is really a matter of like economic capacity to undertake decarbonization, kind of just offering this illusion that like trillions of dollars of private finance will somehow make its way into the electricity sectors and like roll out a clean electricity system in like every single country, which I think is just kind of absurd on the face of it. Which I think in total leads both in domestic context and like the G7 countries, but also internationally, the innumerable investment and divestment decisions necessary for decarbonization are just like really structurally vulnerable to private capital strike and then just kind of broader like malorganization of production and consumption um, kind of because of the way that the profit imperative and liquidity preference work. So what would then constitute an adequate decarbonization regime, like actually a regime that is able to functionally deliver decarbonization? At Commonwealth, we would argue that this would be a green mixed ownership economy where multi-scalar and pluriformed but systemic public ownership um, in and decommodification of critical sectors such as electricity, for example, can begin to one, socialize investment decision-making to divorce it from the profit imperative and liquidity preference of private capital, to integrate and coherently plan investments in economic activity, and then three, um, employ the collective risk-bearing capacity of the state to restructure, stabilize, and expand or phase out production networks. Just kind of thinking that like, we kind of will have this hybrid Frankenstein's monster of like a fossil and green economy that like the state kind of just like needs to bear that. There's just no actor that can, that can bear doing that. So I think kind of to restate all of this as a, an invitation and less of a lecture. I think um, from our view, the problem with private capital from a functional decarbonization perspective is that it just simply can't be relied upon, not just through de-risking, but even coercion by the state into always and everywhere undertaking like fixed capital investment or divestment, and especially not in a particularly well-coordinated way. Um, even in the context of a really robust green developmental estate, this problem might not systemically manifest itself in the process of decarbonization, but it will systemically. I mean, it won't systematically like every single investment decision, but enough of that will happen that it's a huge problem. So I think that the collective um, problem for, for rooms like this is to figure out, on the one hand, what's the full repertoire of mechanisms and institutions that can, um, like a gradation, socialize investment decision-making and effectuate public co like economic coordination, and then on the other, what actually are the concrete assets, firms, institutions, or sectors that are just so critical to decarbonization that we really need to be employing and like building the capacity to employ the strongest possible tools. Um, so put differently, I think we all need to start out the green mix economy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, lots of um, threads to pick up on there. Um, I'm going to move to Olga now. Can you hear us OK? Yes, very well. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure seeing friends and colleagues. Uh, and also congratulations, Anna Kate, uh on putting this event together. Um, I will start with uh, perhaps picking up one of the prompts that, that uh, Anna, you circulated ahead of the conversation, uh, whether industrial policy is back. Um, in Europe, there is, uh, we see a strong shift towards uh, favoring state aid, and that was very difficult to imagine just a few years ago. Of course, in the USA, we um, we have the IRA, and in China, in other Asian economies, we 
well, the industry policy never died, uh, but the policy industry policy tools have changed. Uh, for example, it's um, targeted support to uh, particular industrial champions is not is no longer politically accepted. Um, China might be an, an exception, but it's not no longer accepted in major uh, Asian economies um, in Europe uh, or Germany. And um, overall, I think uh, we should look at the renaissance of industrial policies related to strategic autonomy or tax sovereignty conversations, but also a little bit in a longer term perspective of post uh, global financial crisis, post COVID, more interventionist state. And of course, there are differences, and there is geoeconomics. Uh, in the global context, and comparatively, industrial policy is explicitly formed as a source of competitiveness, uh, including in green sectors, EV batteries, for example, um, in Asia and USA, but less so in Europe. Although, what I mean is there are obviously conversations in the Commission on uh, competitiveness. But um, the reality is that implementation is more soft touch and more decentralized in Europe. Um, and uh, why I refer to Europe more than to other uh, regions or countries is because it kind of uh, presents a particular paradox that nowhere there is so much political and civic support of the green transition. And Green Deal is a good example, but somehow industrial and green policies as I mentioned, they are more soft touch and more, uh, more fragmented and more reactive even uh, because they are not primarily conceived as a source, strategic source of international competitiveness in contrast to the US and, and Asia. So let's just read just uh, a few key dates in, in the European developments of industrial policy. Um, the Commission um, started or announced taking a more vague interpretation on enforcement uh, towards subsidies to R&D and, um, for example, first industrial deployment, and that was around 2014. Then Germany made a U-turn uh, on industrial policy, um, a lot owing to as a response to a China industrial threat. That was 2015-2017 uh, around that time. And of course, in political economy, that was a major change for European context. And then, of course, we have the Chiefs Act, uh, 2023, and, and uh, a lot of analysts and academics alike consider it as a fundamental shift. And why was that? Because um, uh, for the first time, the state aid was encouraged to mass production rather than just R&D. And, and why they consider it as a fundamental shift? Because not even in the 70s, um, state support was promoted to mass production. Of course, we're talking about semiconductors and their rationale or rhetoric was, well, but these are just the semiconductors because they're very important. And here we, of course, we're in the context of post opioid related shortage. Yeah. But um, uh, of course, the question is, if we did this for semiconductors, can we do it for other sectors and then how and, and to what extent? So um, of course, there was high political leadership that did you grow uh, Breton and uh, von der Leyen supported industrial policy wholeheartedly, but there was also large semiconductor firms, including Intel, approaching Commission and some member states, Germany, to lobby for subsidies. So there was a uh, interesting dynamics there, and I just want to perhaps conclude that industrial policy is indeed back, but there is um, there is a very strong impression that it's not resourced enough and exists in isolation from microfinance and financing policies. Um, particularly in Europe, this microeconomic framework does not incentivize a systemic approach to industrial investments, <laughs> or also Melanie uh, emphasizes investments and divestment strategies. Um, and uh, well, that we're bringing the school back in then I guess we need to understand the state better, uh, particularly in terms of what is that financing state, what is that investment state. That would be my uh, final remark for this time. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, and uh, lots of food for thought there as well. Um, okay, so to our final um, uh, introductory remarks from Amir. So thank you for this very nice uh, discussion. Uh, so my three points were about the title of our panel. 
So it was a new era of industrial policy for a just and green transition. So it's, it will be about the just, no sorry, uh, new, just and, and green. So about the new, uh, I think there's a few people in this room who've been working on, on industrial policy for a long time. Some of you even for decades. I'm looking at Richard. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean ahead of the game. I'm saying like uh, way ahead of the curve. That's what I mean. And uh, the way we're seeing this is it's the rise of green industrial policy, but in many ways it's the kind of uh, old New Deal, right, applied to, to the green agenda. And it makes a big difference why industrial policy is back. And I think um, some of us, and me included, especially at the beginning, had the perception that the climate agenda was driven, was driving this emergence of industrial policy because of the acknowledgement that you know, to solve the climate crisis, market-based instruments are not enough, so you actually need stronger state interventions. But in fact, it's really driven by more nationalistic, uh, strategic security concerns right, for the United States. It's not even about building a competitive advantage in those areas, it's about delaying China's uh, unstoppable rise in, 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 in dominance of low carbon supply chains. And as a result, a lot of the instruments that are used are not particularly conducive to uh, what would be a globally responsible industrial policy. Uh, and I think the, what we see with the last round of tariffs imposed by the Biden, Biden administration on Chinese EVs is very much in this spirit. It's not even making goods cheaper for others to access. And we see it as, as well on the financing landscape, right? Very little money is going into uh, low carbon uh, productive uh, systems or renewable energy expansion in the countries that need it the most. So in recent years, if you put it in per capita terms, it's about $180 per capita invested in renewable energy in North America, excluding Mexico. In Sub-Saharan Africa, we have most of the world's population who still lacks access to electricity, it's $1 per capita, right? And there are many issues, financial hurdles, high cost of capital, but that really drives the separation between those that have the means to unlock those green windows of opportunities versus those that won't be able to because they don't have enough funding for a cleaner energy matrix. In that sense, we often speak about the United States playing this villain role, but in fact, the US position is very clear and very explicit but I would, uh, just for the sake, this is not recorded, right? We're having, or is it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that first part. Okay, so we'll talk about the other villains after. <laughs> um, so, and in that context, the rise or thinking about industrial policy in latecomer countries is particularly uh, important, but it's really about the nitty gritty part of what instruments actually work in countries that don't have the same kind of institutional capacity or state capacity to fight this agenda. And for the progressives, it's a particularly important question because this is where, this is where the IMF finally found its narrative about the rise of green industrial policy, right? Obviously, they cannot ignore it, but what they've been hammering is that, oh yeah, it works for countries that have the institutional capacity to do it. So <laughs> US, China, but for the others, you know, mm, yeah, don't do it, it'll be too wasteful. So that is particularly something that we have to fight hard against is really thinking about, well, how do you adapt it to different contexts that don't have as much financial and, and technical um, <coughs> uh, resources, right? Uh, which is to the second point about just. So there is a lot of this kind of national level policies that are driven at the national level that might, might not be just. And I think with Yostan, we had those interesting conversations about industrial policies about competition, right? So why would you be just to others? But in fact, the problem is that the whole system is quite unjust and here I'm, again I'm looking particularly at Richard, Devika, um, uh, uh, Kisten who's been kind of looking at the global structural dynamics that, that create those, those, that situation and I think yesterday there was a discussion on the financial system at the trade level as well, right? The trade system is not uh, leveling the playing field and again another point of conversation for the progressives here is I have the perception, maybe I'm wrong, that we often um, engage with an existing situation. We're very good at analyzing the problems with the current system, but we're always in that position of reaction, right? And not actually setting the agenda of what would 
a globally just trade system or financial system look like and what do we want to push for. And this is particularly important nowadays that there is this kind of complete fog especially around the WTO. So this is the time to really come up with a coherent narrative of what would uh, the role of the WTO for coordination of you know, industrial policies at the global level look like. Uh, so some of you are much better at, at this than, than I am. So this is more a call for people to collectively uh, work on this aspect. And the last thing on the green uh, point of, of the title. This is also a point where some powerful actors have almost unilaterally decided what the green part of green industrial policy looks like and means, right? So this is, at the moment, really about emissions. And of course, that's a challenge that we have to address, and that's particularly a responsibility for nations that have, you know, historically polluted a lot more than others. But this is a tiny fraction of what, the ec of what ecological sustainability means and should look like, especially in countries that face much more uh, visible and pressing issues, issues of water scarcity, issues of biodiversity loss, with the Austin again, many discussions on material footprint and material pollution. And those kind of ecological actions are not often, are sometimes, um, uh, pursuing one can often be done at the expense of others. So then there's a big, big, big challenge on what, how to reconceive green industrial policy right, in the context of different challenges that countries face. And you mentioned hydrogen in your introduction. In some countries that face water scarcity, uh, just pushing for the hydrogen agenda, which is often not driven by them, but by the other villains, which we'll talk about later, uh, <laughs> is not really aligned with ecological uh, dimensions. And uh, it is not green, right? And in countries that have a lot of biodiversity, if you destroy your forestry to put solar panel factories, is that really green industrial policy? And so there's a big work to rethink what it looks like adapting to different contexts, starting points, uh, and not just being about industrial policies, just manufacturing solar panels or wind turbines, because there is a wide array, or array of possibilities. And in fact, producing those goods is exactly what the incumbents are making it very difficult for others to pursue the same strategy, right? So it's very important to be creative and finding <coughs> solutions that work for, for um, latecomers, small nations, and countries with a very different uh, context. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, lots of really important stuff, and I think Amir has really helped us with structuring how we think about this by really interrogating each of the words in this, this title. That's a really valuable way of looking at this. And um, we've touched on so many important aspects, in particular, um, sort of latecomers versus comer advantages, and also just the way in which the rules are stacked against um, big swathes of the world, um, and how new is this um, new industrial policy or this new incarnation of it. Um, so what we're hoping to do now is to return to our tables, to have some sort of rich discussion about this topic. Everyone comes at it with their own expertise as well, so we're hoping you can bring your own sort of research <coughs> interests to it and share that at, at the tables. And we'll do that for 10, 15 minutes before we come back to um, speak with the panel and share our thoughts from each table and ask questions. Um, yeah.